few days ago talking about this. Well, first I want to thank uh, uh, David, um, sorry, <laughs> Robert and Dave for uh, inviting me to come and talk to you today. Uh, my specialty um, has been in the field of neurosciences. And uh, for the past two years, I've been involved in running clinical trials, looking at uh, how hyperbaric oxygen works in uh, reversing uh, some of the injuries associated with traumatic brain injuries. Um, now, since becoming involved with uh, Dave and Robert on this, uh, you know, when I saw the, the NFLAA, the Alumni Association, partnering with Neurostem, which is the drug company that's uh, running this uh, trial, uh, one thing struck me uh, a bit odd about it. So I don't know how familiar everyone is with how FDA uh, proceeds on approving a drug for human use. Uh, there's at least, there's a minimum of three phases, sometimes there's a fourth phase, depending on uh, what the, uh, the outcomes are. But there's three phases, phase one, two, and three. Phase one is where you basically collect data on how a drug is metabolized by the body and any side effects that it might have. And that's usually a small number, you know, anywhere between 10 to 20, sometimes even 50. So they're very small clinical trials. Phase two, then you start getting into hundreds of people. This is more about, okay, you've got a, an idea of how the body metabolizes the drug. You have some idea of the side effects. Now you're looking at to see what sort of effects it has on the disease that you're trying to treat. Uh, and then, uh, and also any other side effects that could pop up because with a larger set, you can actually start seeing a lot more side effects uh, in, in a population. By phase three, uh, that drug is fairly well tested. Now you're actually trying to see how efficacious it is. How good is it at treating that particular disease? So with Neurostem, they have a drug called NSI-189. I tried to look for information regarding what the heck NSI-189 is. I can't tell what it is. There's no publications on it. It's a proprietary compound that this company has. So right now, Neurostem is in phase one of this drug trial. And the documents show that they're only looking, they're only looking to recruit 24 people for this drug trial. That's laughable. Okay, that is basically, we're looking at pharmacology, pharmodynamics, and pharmacokinetics. Basically, how the body metabolizes the drug, and that's it. Why is the NFL Alumni Association partnering with a company that is less than three years old, has no drugs on market, and basically is doing clinical trials at a very early stage? I mean, why would, uh, for example, Walmart decide to front a company looking at, well, you know, a phase one study on uh, back support equipment, things like that, uh, for medical purposes. They're betting, the NFLAA is putting a very sizable bet on a drug that absolutely has no evidence that it works on humans. And there's a major problem with that. Drugs that work on the central nervous system work on your brain and if you don't know what the side effects are, there could be a whole slew of unintended consequences associated with it. Least of which is how it would affect you in legal terms. And I'll leave that to Jason to, uh, to expand on. But there's also the health issues associated with it. Um, I, I do hope that this company does succeed because the, the work that they're doing is innovative and exciting. But when you start recruiting folks um, that have had a series of injuries over the years that are on multiple medications. I wonder if someone, you know, how, uh, in this room, how many people are actually taking medication for anything at this point? High blood pressure, diabetes, anything, heart conditions. So a good, a good number of you. How many of you are taking more than two medications? Three. Four. Okay. Anything beyond three, you start getting into some very complicated interactions. When you start putting in an experimental drug on it, all bets are off. So that's another thing to consider as well. The, the group of, you, you're, you, you would be considered high risk in that regard. And uh, if I had the option of participating in a drug trial like this, I would say no, I would not do it myself. 
That would, that would be my, my definition. Phase one drug trials are fairly risky uh, because there's so many unknowns about it as well. So uh, with that, I, if you have any more questions, uh, I'd be more than happy to answer any, anything in particular regarding that. The drug compound is called NSI-189. 189. Neural stem, N-E-U-R-A-L, and then S-T-E-M. And it's a fairly young company. Uh, they are uh, basically in their description, they're saying that the drugs that they're looking for stimulate the production of stem cells in the brain or in the central nervous system. And they have uh, evidence in animal models that they get that, but no evidence in humans that that's what's happening. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's still fairly, fairly early on in that regard. Are they competing with another patent? That's another major problem. And this is a variation? Neurostem has a, what we call a very niche market right now. They're one of the few companies that actually uh, have shown in at least uh, Petri dishes that their drug compound induces, or induces stem cell production. So I don't know if there's other companies out there that do that, but the compound uh, NSI-189 uh, might be something like a, an SSRI, an analog of an SSRI. If you take uh, one of these drugs, uh, like the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, Prozac, things like that, uh, some studies have shown that Prozac can induce production of neural stem cells in the brain, and they think that that might be one of the mechanisms. So they're trying to see if they can actually juice the, uh, the molecule, or that might be one of the reasons that they're, they're doing it. So again, y usually when you do uh, clinical drug trials, you want a fairly, uh, what they call a, a clean population, which is basically a, a, a population that's relatively healthy, takes very few drugs to maintain other conditions, so they can get a very clean read on what the drug output is. Uh, why the AA is actually doing this is beyond me. Uh, this is the first time I've actually seen or heard of a company making such a big gamble like this, especially when they're not, they don't have a financial uh, skin in the game in this case. Uh, and personally, as someone who's actually been taking part in clinical trials and running clinical trials, I, I find it a bit, uh, uh, well, what's the word I'm looking for? It lacks a bit of rigor and a bit of uh, care in thinking about what they're doing right there. Because again, this is a, a population that, you know, the fewer drugs you can take, the better. Disqualify. Correlation. So when, when you take a drug trial, or when you're part of a drug trial, you have to meet certain criteria, right? Are you on this many drugs? Uh, are you a certain age? Do you have this certain condition? So there's a screening tool that you have to use in order to uh, meet those criteria. Depending on, and I'll get into a little more detail here, the FDA requires that uh, a drug company have an independent, what they call a institutional review board. And this Institutional Review Board, or IRB, is responsible for re reviewing the documents of a drug study, especially consent forms. Now, they don't say which IRB you have to use. A lot of companies, they create their own internal IRBs, so they can do pretty much whatever they want. So oversight is a bit of an issue as well. The problem with consent forms is if you don't read the fine print, you, you can get into a lot of trouble. For example, uh, there's been cases where you have IRB forms or consent forms that basically say you can't talk about the drug trial. Or uh, you can't discuss the re your results with anyone else. Uh, or in the case, I mean, what we've seen with NFL, NFLPA, is they might even try and sneak in maybe a couple of clauses in there saying that if you participate in this drug trial, you're no longer eligible for X, Y, and Z. So, if you decide to participate, make sure you read the consent forms carefully. Make sure that you uh, go in, the, in this with wide, eyes wide open and don't do it because you're desperate.
I mean, that is not the right way to go. There are alternatives, uh, as we've been hearing here. There are other avenues to pursue uh, that cost less and have fewer side effects and lower risk uh, to many, uh, many people here. That's the big question. Uh, we don't know what sort of a relationship uh, the NFLAA has with NeuroSTEM or what sort of deal they've worked out. Pardon me? You would, but again, the NFLAA is not a clinical organization. NeuroSTEM is. I, I'm going to interject here for a minute, Javier. Yeah. I, just discovered, I just discovered that in March sometime, a large venture capital firm gave this company a $7 million debt finance. I don't know who the company is. It's a billion dollar fund. Would it surprise you if maybe one of the NFL owners happened to have money in the fund? Probably not. So I'm just, the whole thing smells kind of funny. Just trying to give you guys a warning on this. All right, I'll keep it brief. I guess you want my perspective from a legal standpoint on this drug as it relates to the NFL Alumni Association. I'll take you back to last year when I told you about starting the concussion lawsuits. There was always three goals to it. Number one was to educate so that this new generation would never have the same problems and the same struggles that you had. We've accomplished that. Number two is to get authentic, real medical treatment for you guys. It's a question you have to ask yourself anytime you hear one of these things. Is this authentic? What's the source? And what's it going to do for you? Who's sponsoring it? Who's paying for it? Those are the questions that need asked. And then number three, we talked about earlier today, our goal was always get you compensation for your injuries. Now, concerning this drug, from what I understand, and, and, and Javier is a, a lot better to uh, discuss this issue, but from what I understand, this drug that is a trial drug is to be solely for purposes of treating the symptom of depression. I'm no doctor, but I saw Dr. Amalu a little while ago say that people who have CTE had two pages full of two columns worth of various symptoms. I like to always use this phrase, and I've used it for many years when discussing the concussion cases. It's putting a Band-Aid on a brain injury. So. I don't want to ever go on record of saying, do I recommend it, do I not recommend it? I'm not a doctor, I'm not qualified to go there. Those are questions you need to ask yourself, and that's just from a legal perspective as to what you need to explore before you go down that road. Anything else? Boom, 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 bo